Okay, so um, <clears throat> for uh, this lecture, we will be talking about the effects of strokes for uh, the USMLE Step 1, a uh, very high yield topic and a uh, very complicated one. Um, it gets really easy once you understand the whole process, but to keep every one of these presentations in mind and uh, according to the arteries uh, for which it occurs is a bit difficult, but uh, I will try to break it down and do as easy as possible by basically mentioning which part of this table will be in the question and which part of this table will be in your answers. So when you are trying to review the whole thing in a short span of time, you know exactly what to read. And I will also mention uh, the extremely high yield uh, sentences from the table. So uh, just bear with me and um, try to um, underline with a highlighter in your book or in your PDF accordingly. Uh, hopefully it will help. So um, at the same time, I would also uh, tell you how um, each and every time uh, questions from strokes will present in your uh, exam. The good news about this table is uh, the examiners know that it's a difficult table to keep in mind because most of the symptoms will overlap one another, but there are some symptoms or signs which are very particular to a given artery. And uh, once you have that in your mind specifically, it's extremely easy to know uh, which artery they want you to differentiate from all the other ones. So uh, let's begin. Before we do, I just want to give a quick um, brush up on uh, the circle of Willis, uh, which is the blood supply to the brain. Uh, most of which we studied in our basic science in high school or during our bachelor years. Um, so this is uh, what I'm referring to. You, can, you should also have had, uh, you, 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 uh, you, you also should have had a, a, a review of the Circle of Willis and uh, the physiology chapter of uh, the neurology and the USME step one. So uh, this should help you for that too. So basically the Circle of Willis is this. Um, the circle, the, this circle over here, that's what they're referring to. So we are going to come to this in a minute. So the initial, uh, initial arteries are your vertebral arteries. Uh, you can see two over here. Uh, they, this basically branches off, uh, when the heart pumps blood from the left ventricle out to the, uh, aorta, uh, it goes to the arch of the aorta. And, and once it does, it, uh, the arch gives off blood supply. So on your right, you have your, brachio, you have your brachiocephalic trunk, and on the left, you have your left common carotid and your left subclavian. And then the right, brachios, right brachiocephalic um, divides into the right common carotid and the right subclavian. So uh, from the right subclavian, you have your right vertebral artery. And uh, from the left subclavian, you have your left vertebral artery. So basically that's how uh, the arteries come through. So basically from the left ventricle to the heart, to the aorta, from the arch of the aorta through the subclavian arteries, you have your vertebral arteries, which comes and it merges together to form the basilar artery. And the basilar arteries bifurcate over here to uh, uh, left and right posterior cerebral artery and um, the superior cerebellar artery. Um, basically, the basilar arteries branches off into posterior cerebral artery and the superior cere cerebellar artery is just a branch of the basilar artery. So just a, a quick recap again, uh, the vertebral arteries comes from your right and left subclavian, merges to form the basilar artery, which branches into uh, posterior, right and left posterior cerebral artery. And uh, over here, you have your, you have your middle cerebral and your anterior cerebral artery. 
uh, both of which comes from the internal carotid artery. Uh, so once again, uh, blood from the left ventricle goes to the main aorta, to the arch of the aorta, and uh, from instead of uh, the subclavian, which gives rise to the vertebral, the blood uh, which goes to the middle cerebral and the anterior cerebral, it comes from the internal carotid arteries, which are branches of the right and left common carotid arteries. Uh, the internal carotid arteries gives rise to the to the middle cerebral and to the anterior cerebral. And of course, um, a bit out of the topic, you have your external cerebral arteries, which are also a branch of your right and left uh, common carotids. And the external carotid artery gives blood supply to the uh, areas of the face and neck. So uh, that's that's not important for, for the circle of willis. The important arteries are your right and left internal ca internal carotids, which give rise to um, the middle cerebral and the anterior ce anterior cerebral. So once it does, uh, the right and left anterior cerebral uh, they connect with an anterior co anterior communicating artery, and uh, the middle cerebral will connect with the posterior cerebral through posterior communicating arteries, one for each side. And um, that's that. And you have your small branch over here, ophthalmic artery, a relatively less high yield artery for the US Family Step 1, at least for uh, this chapter. And then your anterior choroidal arteries, again, relatively less high yield for this chapter. The arteries which I want you to focus on are your middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, your um, vertebral, anterior spinal, basilar, posterior inferior cerebral, and uh, your anterior inferior cerebellar. Posterior inferior cerebellar and anterior inferior cerebellar. Keep in mind, cerebellar means blood supply to the cerebellum, not the cerebrum so uh i know you you guys all know that uh, just to avoid confusions and um so basically you have your basilar arteries over here giving rise to superior cerebral uh, basilar and anterior inferior cerebellar arteries so uh this is the whole breakdown of the circle of willis uh once again i asked most of my students to take pictures of high yield images in their cell phone or laptop so uh, you can do that for this one too just to keep in mind uh, because it's extremely high yield for both step one and step two so uh, having said that let's go back to our text the first artery which we will talk about is the middle cerebral artery which is this artery over here and before we do i just want to show you which part of the brain this uh, artery supplies to it's um, so you have this uh, view of the brain like the lateral view of the, of the of the brain if you were to see it from the lateral side this is the part of the brain which is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and uh, the homunculus which literally means the part of the bodies which are innervated by um, white matter arising from this part of the cerebral cortex are your, uh, basically your um, face and your uh, upper limbs. So face and upper limbs, that's what it is. So uh, since since uh, it does affect the face and upper limb, if something were to happen uh, to the supply of uh, blood through this artery, uh, eventually there will be uh, an ischemia uh, in this part of the brain, which will give rise to the neurological sign symptoms in your face uh, and um, your upper limbs. So it will start will with uh, if, if it's a if, if it's i mean like if it's an uh, infarct or em or, a, or an embolus um the most common or the most common presentations are your paralysis and also keep in mind that if it's um one side of uh, the brain uh, 
if it's this side, let's say this is the left side and this is the right side. So if this part of the left um, middle cerebral is affected, then your presenting sign symptoms will be on the right side of your body. So let's say the um, left um, um, part of this uh, brain is affected. So you're, you will have contralateral paralysis of the opposite side because the white matters will have a pyramidal decussation, which is basically, um, I'm sorry, which is basically, uh, let's say this is your brain and uh, the white matter is coming through over here, will go down to the pyramid and they will decussate. And so if something were to happen, you will have your sign symptoms in this part of the body. So contralateral paralysis, the same goes for anterior cerebral artery. So let's begin with our text. Uh, having said that, now things should be relatively a bit easy for you to review and recall. So uh, the first artery is your middle cerebral uh, artery. Um, the at first, let me let me talk about how uh, the questions will present. It will present will with, with this part of the table. So it's not extremely high yield that you try to test yourself whether you know this part of the table or not because this will be presented in your question. So if you do want to test yourself, make sure that you cover this part of the table with your hand or with like whatever you want to do it with, and try to see if you can really uh, if you can if you can really uh, uh, get it right which artery they're talking about by looking at the sign symptoms. So uh, the, the first artery is middle cerebral artery. The sign symptoms are your contralateral paralysis and uh, sensory loss because there will be both motor and your sensory loss because um, you can see over here, this is the sensory part and this is the motor. So if there is cutoff of blood supply over here and here, you will get, you will get contralateral paralysis and your your sensory loss, um, which will also be uh, contralateral. So contralateral motor and contralateral loss of sensory sensations in the face and uh, and upper limb. Along with that, uh, it will also affect the temporal lobe, which also which which contains your Warnings and Broca's area, giving rise to aphasia if it's in the dominant and uh, hemineglet if it's in the non-dominant. If you ask me the reason for this is the way I try to remember it is if it's in the dominant one, that's the part of your brain which is more developed because you tend to use it more. So uh, it, it uh, rarely causes aphasia when the middle cerebral artery affects the non-dominant part of your uh, brain. Let's say if you're a right-handed person then the left part of your brain is more dominant. So if, if the middle cerebral artery on the left side is affected, you will develop aphasia. If it's on the right side, you will not. You will develop hemineglect, basically meaning that you will neglect uh, everything um, halfway through. So uh, this is relatively not that high yield. You might get one or two questions indicating you to this arterial infarction by saying that there is a, there is a hemineglect. But what uh, the high yields are, basically aphasia and your contralateral paralysis of loss, uh, uh, contralateral paralysis and sensory loss of your face and upper limb. This is exactly how they will try to uh, present the question. Uh, they will paint a scenario in your question stem. And uh, they will relatively make the question a bit easy for uh, strokes. That's the good news. They only try to ask you if they, if you know which artery they're trying to talk about. So um, it's good enough for you to know uh, this is the one because they rarely ask you which lobe of the brain is affected. So um, that's something you don't have to worry about. So just try to realize that this is some, that this part of this table will be in the question stem. This is exactly the amount that will be in it. And this is what they want you to differentiate from the answer stem that you know that this represents middle cerebral arterial infarction. Uh, having said that, there is a small mnemonic which I will use um, just in case that you do forget. You don't necessarily have to use it, but I used it for my exam because there are so many informations to keep in mind for the USMLE step one. So this is what I use. So um, uh, middle, 
I, I thought about, uh, let's say, if you walk in the middle of the street, you should be very concentrated. You should not talk to anyone because of obvious reasons. There are cars coming from multiple sides. You want to avoid getting hit. So you would want to stay quiet. Aphasia, you wouldn't want to talk. So that's, that's basically what I use to remember uh, if I cannot uh, jot it down if for some reason, if I go through some sort of uh, like a mental fart or something for some reason, which I can't remember uh, which symptoms are associated with middle cerebral uh, like caries, and it happens to the best of us. Just try to remember if you walk in the middle of the street, you should be quiet. So aphasia, and obviously, you know, there will be contralateral paralysis and sensory loss of the face and upper limb. Uh, the Warnix aphasia is associated with the right superior quadrant vis uh, visual defects due to temporal lobe involvement. This is a, this is not something which you should pay a lot of attention to right now because you will read this in your visual field defects, which I will cover later. So at least for this table's sake, uh, this should be enough for you to underline and review and recall multiple times. The next one is your anterior cerebral arteries. Um, same reason, it's this artery they're referring to, and this is the artery which supplies this part of the brain, which contains uh, the lower limbs and the homunculus. So an infarction will cause uh, sensory loss of your lower limbs, and of course, your contralateral paralysis of the lower limbs. So that's exactly what they said, uh, contralateral paralysis and sensory loss, which is how the patient will present with. Uh, and uh, these patients will also have urinary incontinence. I did not try to dig a bit, dig any deeper why this happens. Um, but this is how I remembered that anterior cerebral artery is associated with urinary incontinence. Once again, by another silly mnemonic, which is... Um, uh, Children who are scared of ants, um, when they see one, they might pee themselves. So um, when you see an ant, you get scared, you pee yourself. So you get. Um, this is how I used uh, to keep in my mind that um, anterior cerebral arterial infarction causes urinary incontinence. I know it, it shouldn't work. It shouldn't work for like everyone else, but at least if hearing to this lecture uh, makes you remember that um, anterior cerebral artery is associated with urinary incontinence because the ant in anterior is is what uh, ant pho and phobic children will see and they pee themselves so uh, if you can try to remember if you try to if you can try to remember this from my lectures then it's completely worth it so that's that so basically middle cerebral arteries aphasia anterior cerebral arteries, urinary incontinence. And then you have your basic contralateral paralysis and sensory loss of face and upper limb, contralateral paralysis and sensory loss of lower limbs. So uh, extremely high yield. Once again, this is what they will have in the question stem and they will see whether you can differentiate uh, the anterior cerebral artery from all the, from all the other ones. Next one is lenticulostriate arteries. Uh, and extremely, extremely high yield arteries because uh, more often than none, this is what uh, they will paint a very difficult scenario with and see whether you can answer that the artery they're referring to is your lenticulostriate arteries or not. And the answer stem will, will, will contain more than one thing. So basically, uh, the, your lenticulostriate arteries supply the striatum, the part of your basal ganglia, and your internal capsule. As we all know, that internal capsule is the uh, is the relay station where uh, the white matters, I mean the the motor tracks they pass through. So if there were to be a blood cut off to the internal internal capsule, you will basically get no motor action. So if it happens on the right side of the right internal capsule, it, the effects would be on the left once again because there is a pyramidal decussion. So there is a pure motor stroke. Uh, it, 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 it won't be uh, just particular to the upper and the lower limb. It will be uh, on both upper and lower limbs. So um, contralateral paralysis, 
due to pure uh, due to um, the lenticular stride arterial infarction to the internal capsule and the resulting would be a pure motor stroke so uh, this is what they will present in the question stem and uh, there will also be absence of cortical signs aphasia and your visual loss so uh, these are relatively a bit less high yielded um, presentations for the exam because they will literally test you uh, by letting you know that uh, the patient has contralateral paralysis of uh, the whole side of uh, one body, like the whole side of the left or the whole side of the right, depending on which part of the, which side of the, which sided internal capsule was affected. So the patient will present with pure motor stroke. Uh, at times they might just uh, tell you um, that the internal capsule was affected just indirectly letting you know that it's a lenticular stride arteries. And in the answer, they would try to test you by seeing whether you know that a blood cutoff to internal capsule results in pure motor stroke or not. Uh, they will try to test you whether you can differentiate this from uh, an ischemia or a blood supply cutoff to the thalamus because uh, blood cutoff from the thalamus will result in a pure sensory stroke. And uh, the one, then the blood cut off to the internal capsule will, re will result in a pure motor stroke. So that's that. Common locations of lacunar infarcts are in your picture number B, which is this, showing uh, the infarction in the internal capsule. And the most common reason, uh, the most common reason is due to high line arteriosclerosis, which is uh, which occurs um, due to uh, unmanaged hypertension, a uh, very high yielded, um, a uh, very high yielded topic for the USMLE step one once again, which you should have covered by now in your general pathology lectures, and also from uh, Pathoma by Dr. Hosseini Sattar. So I would not mm -hmm. dig deeper into what this thing is. Uh, I'm sure you guys know. So that's that. So we're done with the anterior circulation. Uh, now we will move to the posterior circulation. Just uh, we will do a quick review of the blood supply once again because it's a bit complicated and the presentations are multiple. So this is the posterior circulation, which they were talking about. And we already talked about the lesions of the anterior one. So for the posterior one, they will, the first artery is anterior spinal arteries, which is this artery over here. This uh, basically branches off from the vertebral artery and it goes down supplying the posterior part of the, your spinal cord. And since it does, the first thing which it does affect is the corticospinal tract, which goes down with it. So then, and then the next thing which it, which it does attack, I mean, which it does uh, hamper is, I mean, the blood supply hampers um, the function of the dorsal column medial laminiscus which uh, is the white matter is from your dorsal column and the caudal part of your medulla, which contains the hypoglossal nerve. So uh, don't worry about this. Uh, th this will be relatively a bit easy in, 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 in one moment. Let's focus on the presentation first. So first and foremost, the patient will present with contralateral paralysis once again of the upper and lower limbs, uh, just as how it might, it might present on with uh, in an internal capsular lesion but with this one the patient will also have decreased contralateral proprioception which he, which is uh, basically i'm sure you know the what the what uh, proprioception is it's basically a joint position and um, this is uh, done through uh, the dorsal column as uh, this is a sensory sensation, of course, and um, since there is a lesion of the medial lemniscus due to the a due to uh, an ASA infarct, you will get contralateral proprioception, uh, decreased contralateral proprioception. Uh, so uh, this is a bit different from uh, the the effects of stroke described with lenticular stride arteries. So, and the next one is since it affects uh, the caudal part of your medulla because this is where the caudal part of the medulla is. Uh, 
it contains the hypoglossal nerve. So what happens with this one is there is ipsilateral, not contralateral, ipsilateral hypoglossal dysfunction. So basically, if you can, if you can imagine a patient as a future physician who has, uh, let's say, when you're doing a new uh, neurological examination, you will notice that the patient has a contralateral par uh, paralysis. The first thing which might come to your mind is a lesion to the lenticular arteries, but then you start checking that the patient has decreased um, joint sensation, uh, that is decreased proprioception, which can be evaluated with a positive or negative Romberg test. And the next thing which you see when you examine his or her tongue is the tongue is deviated to a side, uh, the side opposite of the loss of sensation of the, of the loss of joint or loss of uh, uh, proprioception. So immediately you should think about uh, medial medullary syndrome. That's what this three syndromes, three uh, signs and symptoms represent. That is contralateral paralysis, decreased contralateral proprioception, and ipsilateral hypoglossal dysfunction. Since they did not give any any mnemonic for this artery, I came up with mine once again. I used the word tasty. Tasty. Because T, for me, it represents tongue. AS in tasty represents anterior spinal artery. So uh, with this, I remember I try to remember that there is deviation of the tongue to the ipsilateral side, just as how I used um, scared of ants for anterior cerebral that a, that a child may pee himself. And uh, also for the fact that when you walk in the middle of the road, you should be quiet, aphasia. I used the same method. I came up with the word tasty because um, this helps me remember that the tongue deviates in the ipsilateral side. Once again, the tongue the tongue will deviate on the ipsilateral side because there is no decussion of the central nervous system nerves. So that's that. And it's caused by infarct of paramedian branches of ASA or vertebral arteries, a sentence not very high yield. So don't worry about that. So we're done with most of them. The next one is your pica, posterior inferior cerebral artery. Um, the, uh, uh, what I am going to do is most of these parts of the table overlaps with the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So I will at first focus on the signs and symptoms which are very particular to the, to the artery itself. And later I will discuss these ones. So uh, let's look at the posterior inferior cerebellar artery first. This is the artery they're referring to. And uh, this, is the part, this is the artery which is responsible for the blood supply to the lateral medulla, not the caudal one. The caudal, the caudal medulla is supplied by anterior spinal artery and the lateral medulla is supplied by posterior inferior cerebellar artery. You, once you, uh, you, you can get a more, you can get a bit more clear about this once you study the blood supply of medulla by itself, a, a topic I may or may not cover cover later. But I highly suggest that if you get the time, you do do that. But for now, just try to remember that the caudal part of the medulla is supplied by anterior spinal artery, and uh, the lateral part is supplied by posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So what happens is when it when the blood supply is cut off from the lateral medulla. This part of the medulla contains nucleus ambiguus, which could, which is a constellation of uh, this three central nervous system cell bodies, uh, which are your uh, 9, 10, and 11. So according to what um, according to the supplies which the which these central nervous systems have, um, the patient uh goes through dysphagia hoarseness and decrease gag reflex and hiccups so um this this is a um, relatively very high yield for the exam because you will confuse it with this artery with anterior inferior cerebellar artery because most of these symptoms will overlap one another but it's extremely extremely important that you realize that a patient with these overlapping symptoms and signs, if he or she presents with dysphagia and hoarseness, 
and decrease gag reflex, then this is the artery they're referring to. For this one, they gave a mnemonic, which I personally use myself because it's relatively easy, which said, don't pick a horse that can't eat. So don't pick a stands for pica, which is posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Horse means hoarseness uh, due to the due to loss of blood supply to the vagus nerve, CN10. That can't eat dysphagia due to uh, due to the ninth cranial nerve. So don't pick a horse that can't eat. Um, and then tasty for anterior spinal arteries, ipsilateral hypoglossal, the tongue will deviate on the same side. Um, and then stepping on an ant makes you pee, which is urinary incontinence for anterior cerebral. And when you cross the middle of the road, be quiet, aphasia. So um, that's that. Now let's talk about, I, I will come to these ones first, uh, these ones in a minute, but let's talk about the particular particular signs and symptoms of the arteries by itself. The next one is your anterior inferior cerebral, cerebellar artery, I'm sorry, cerebellar artery. And uh, this is the artery which they are referring to, which is the part of your basilar artery. And um, so we know that there you, you have your brainstem, which is midbrain, pons, and your medulla. So this is the medullary part supplied by the circle of Willis. And uh, this is the pontine part, which is supplied by the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And thus there is um, cut off of blood supply to the lateral pons. And this is the part of uh, the brainstem which contains your facial nucleus. So lateral medulla containing nucleus ambiguous, lateral pons containing facial nucleus. And um, you have your caudal medulla which contains the hypoglossal nerve. So, so medulla as a whole, caudal part supplied by anterior spinal artery containing hypoglossal nerve, medulla lateral part supplied by posterior inferior cerebellar artery containing nucleus ambiguous, Pons, lateral part supplied by anterior inferior cerebellar artery containing facial nucleus. Should be relatively a bit easy once you understand the location of uh, these part of these uh, of these parts of the brainstem and the arteries which they supply. So uh, as a result, if there is cutoff of blood supply to the facial nucleus, there will be paralysis of the face, lower motor neuron lesion, lower motor neuron lesion versus upper motor neuron lesion. Uh, this is a relatively high yield topic for the USM step one two. You should be able to differentiate which lesion represents a lower motor one and which lesion um, represents an upper motor one. So for this one, this will be an upper motor neuron lesion, not a lower not a lower motor one. And uh, since it is an upper motor neuron lesion, there will be decreased lacrimation, decreased salivation. Uh, decreased taste from the anterior two-third of the tongue, basically cut off of all um, the functions of the facial nerve. So um, nerves, The I will discuss more deeply about the facial nerve in uh, my other lecture, but for now, if even if you don't know, which is, which I think you should, that the facial nerve has these functions because these are very basic knowledge about your cranial nerves. So uh, if there is loss of blood supply to the facial nerve, the patient will have decreased lacrimation, salivation, and decreased taste. So when you examine a patient in your residency program and you come across a patient who has these symptoms along with uh, paralysis of the face, you should directly start thinking about uh, cut off of blood supply to the facial nerve, most probably due to the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And uh, let's now let's talk about the signs symptoms which will overlap because uh, since these arteries are a bit close in proximity to one another, there are some certain parts of the brain which they supply together, which are your vestibular nuclei, your spinal thalamic tracts and trigeminal nucleus, and your sympathetic sympathetic fibers. Um, so the vestibular nuclei is the nuclei which is supplied by both pica and ica. 
which mean uh, meaning posterior inferior and anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So once it does, the patient will have vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. Uh, spinothalamic tract, which is and spinal trigeminal nucleus, again affected by both. So spinothalamic tract is responsible for your pain and temperature sensation. So cutoff of blood supply will result in decreased uh, contralateral pain and uh, temperature sensations. Very easy to uh, realize why, because there is a decussation once again when it goes all the way up to the somatosensory cortex. So there, that's the reason for the contralateral um, cutoff of your sensations. And then since the sympathetic fibers are affected, the patient will present with uh, same-sided Horner syndrome, which is basically your ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Those three syndrome, those three signs and symptoms, which represents a Horner syndrome. So just a small recap again for, for these ones. Uh, sign symptoms particular to, to pica is dysphagia hoarseness. Sign symptoms particular to ica is paralysis of face. And um, sign symptoms overlapping will be vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus due to vestibular nuclei, decreased pain and temperature sensation from contralateral body and ipsilateral face uh, due to the effect of trigeminal nucleus and lateral spinal spinothalamic tract because try to remember that the trigeminal nucleus contains uh, sensations from the same side. There are no decussations and the uh, spinothalamic tracts will decussate once and then reach the somatosensory cortex. Does the reason for the contralateral uh, uh, body decreased pain and temperature sensation and ipsilateral phase. Uh, once again, because the face is supplied by trigeminal nerve. So I, I keep on emphasizing on this fact because I don't want you to get confused. And also another thing will get overlap. Another sign symptom will get overlap, which is your same-sided uh, sympathetic fibers for which you, the patient, will get ipsilateral Horner syndrome. Uh, the rest of the sign symptoms which, it can, which the ICA does supply is a bit relatively high, uh, low, low yield also for this because most of the times uh, the question, uh, we do tend to miss um, the ataxia and dysmetria in a question stem. But if you can, that's amazing. I personally couldn't. So, um, so whenever you come across a question with the, with the patient starting with, uh, with the patients, uh, with the question stem, drawing a patient scenario where the patient has same-sided ataxia and dysmetria. Also, uh, try not to think that it's all it's always a cerebellar lesion. There could also be something wrong with um, his or her blood supply due to the ICA and PICA. So uh, that's that. Um, also, uh, this syndrome, the one containing di di uh, dysphagia, hoarseness, and decreased gag, gag reflex, are call your lateral medullary syndrome because of obvious reasons for the lateral uh, medulla that this artery supplies. And um, since this this artery supplies the lateral pons, it's called the lateral pontine syndrome, which is your paralysis of the face and all the other sign symptoms which it contains. So uh, the mnemonic which they use for ICA is facial droop means ICA spooked. Uh, mnemonic which I personally use myself too. Uh, due to the fact that it's extremely hard to break down all the other uh, the all the other reasons for why this is happening, so I tried to stick to my mnemonics for my strokes, and it has helped me a lot. Hope it does the same for you. When you cross the middle, of, uh, so once again, when you cross the middle of the streets, keep quiet. Aphasia, me, middle for middle stable artery. Uh, boy stepping on an ant, got scared and peed himself. Urinary incontinence for anterior cerebellar arteries. Uh, there are no specific mnemonics for the lenticular stride arteries because uh, it's hard to make one, but just try to realize that uh, it's just a pure motor stroke just by itself, along with or absence or presence of um, the cortical signs, mostly absence. Uh, once you know all the all the other sign symptoms of the arteries, uh, you sh it should be very easy for you to differentiate a lenticular stride arterial infarction. So don't worry about coming up with a mnemonic for this one. The next one, I I, I, uh, I said that the uh, mnemonic which I used was tasty because there is ipsilateral deviation of the tongue and all the other sign symptoms uh, which I have described before. Next one is don't pick a horse that can eat. Dysphagia hoarseness for pica, uh, pica, Posterior inferior cerebellar artery, 
and the facial group means eye goes poop, um, paralysis of the face. So uh, I don't want you to just blatantly memorize the mnemonic over here and uh, go through with your exam without understanding exactly how th this happened. Uh, the reason why I ask you to focus more on your mnemonic because uh, when you get a brain block, uh, the mnemonics may help you, but it's extremely, extremely important for our students and, uh, and us future physicians that we realize why um, these sign symptoms are happening because this is exactly what will be present in the question stem and they will test you whether you know the arteries involved for for these lesions or not. Uh, the next one is a relatively easy because the, sign, because the symptoms are very particular to this artery. It's your basilar artery, which is basically this big artery over here. Basilar artery, if for some reason the patient has a cutoff of blood supply to this artery, the, um, uh, the patient will present with quadriplegia, which is your loss of voluntary facial which is your loss of, uh, I mean, your paralysis of all three limbs, all four limbs, I'm sorry, uh, both upper limbs and lower limbs. And also there will be loss of voluntary facial mouth and tongue movements. And um, that's because this, uh, this that's because this artery supplies uh, uh, the, the corticospinal and the corticobulbar tracts. So a major, major cutoff of this artery will result in these severe symptoms. So you come across a patient scenario where there is uh, paralysis of all four limbs along with absolutely no movement except uh, the eyes will move only horizontally, not vertically. So imagine a patient just lying there and you go and try to examine the patient and the patient cannot move any one of these limbs and uh, no, no tongue movement, only thing it can move or he or she can move are their eyes and once you ask them to look up they can't so this type of scenario is extremely extremely particular to a basilar arterial infarction and uh, it tends to affect the reticular activating system uh, which is basically a relay station for all the other nerves so basically once it does um, yeah, the consciousness is impaired and if it is paired the consciousness is preserved a uh, very um a very high yielded uh disease for the usmd step one a very high yielded infarction for the usmd step one uh this this syndrome is basically called a locked in syndrome basically because this is how a patient feels that he or she is locked inside their body because they want to do something but they can't except moving their eyes um, horizontally not even vertically, because uh, the ocular cranial nerve nuclei is uh, affected, and also the PPRF, which is your paramedian pontine reticular formation. So this is uh, supplied by your basilar artery. Um, I have not come across many questions where they ask you out of nowhere which um, arteries supply PPRF, but um, since this is a very um, high-yielded uh, high-yielded high yielded artery for the USMD step one, I highly suggest that you do not skip out any single words from this table stem. The next one is relatively uh, less yield, at least for the sake of this table, because you will come across this, uh, this arterial lesion in your visual field defect, because this is the posterior cerebral artery they're talking about. So uh, this is the posterior cerebral artery, basically what the basilar artery branches off to. And... Um, this applies the occipital lobe, and this results with contralateral hemianopia with your macular sparing because the macula is not supplied by the posterior cerebral artery, so it's spared. And alexia without agraphia, if it um, affects the dominant hemisphere, I'm just going to redo this, I mean undo this. That's because it's not extremely high yield because you will not be able to differentiate that alexia with a, without agraphia uh, is referring to this artery lesion. So just try to remember that contralateral hemianopia with macular sparing. So contralateral hemianopia with macular sparing because the macula is not supplied by the PCA. So uh, this is the high yielded point for you to remember for this question. So that's that for the strokes of USMLE step one. I hope this helped. Um, for more videos, please um, follow me on my page on Facebook at Dr. Hydri. And uh, best of luck. Let me know if there is anything else you want me to cover.